In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let all things be done decently and in order. These words, my friends, were written by St. Paul and addressed to the church in Corinth. Let all things be done decently and in order. Apparently, during worship services, there was disorder. Someone felt they had a divine teaching. Another felt called to share a prophecy. And still others interrupted the services by speaking in strange tongues. So St. Paul rightfully stepped in and exhorted the people, let all things be done for edification, decently and in order. But you know, I was thinking, I guess at times what is considered decent and in order can be up for debate from different people. Let's take baptism, for example. Some of you may be familiar with the actress Rita Wilson. Now, Miss Wilson is a cradle Orthodox Christian. 30 years ago, she married the famous actor Tom Hanks, who eventually converted to Orthodoxy himself. And I think it was this couple that, that was on The Tonight Show, and they were, uh, it was a clip about the baptism, describing the baptism of their first child. The Hanks family on one side was in horror, watching from the pews as this traumatized child was undressed, covered with oil, dunked into a strange font three times, poked at with chrism on the eyes and the nose and the mouth, and then this bearded, you know, person with robes comes in with scissors and starts chopping off his hair. All the while this was going on, the Wilson family on the other side was all smiles with cameras in hand and, you know, thinking it's all adorable. So what is decent and in order? Uh, and what about, what about the expressions of orthodoxy from different cultures around the world? It's interesting how our little orthodoxy respects the culture that she is in. Our Eritrean community, for example, who use, occasionally use our facilities for their worship services. I don't know if you've ever attended their services, but I have never seen such culture, such vivid color, inclusion of everyone, dancing to drum beats, singing, young and old, amazing unbelievable sight and sound an amazing experience a lot of moving parts so indeed in some cases who is to say what is decent and in order well i must tell you that no matter what culture you are in orthodox worship there are two liturgical actions which are not subject to interpretation I am specifically referring to the small entrance with the Evangelion, the, good, the, 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 the gospel, that small entrance, and then, of course, the reading of the gospel, where there should be attention. Sophia, Orthi. And then, of course, there's the great entrance, the procession of the holy gifts, and, of course, the distribution of those holy gifts, again, there must be solemnity at that time. I remember as a young man watching my father at worship. There were times during the liturgy it was tough for him to stand. His knees were even worse than mine. And no matter how much pain he was in, when it came time for the great entrance of the holy gifts, my father found a way to fight through the pain and stand. The same is true with the reading of the Holy Gospel. It's interesting. In case you weren't aware, the liturgy is composed of two parts, and those two parts are what it is composed of. The liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the gifts. It is as if Mother Church knows that as a mother, 
Both are needed to nurture our life in Christ. Our minds must be transformed by the words of God. Our intellects need to hear the words of God. On the other hand, Mother Church also knows that our souls must be fed by the very body and blood of Christ. So what an awesome tandem that is to feed the mind and to feed the soul. Today, I'd like to specifically touch on the importance of the scriptures. When I was a young adult, before I even went to the seminary, I made it a goal of mine to read the Bible cover to cover. And I accomplished that goal. And I can honestly tell you, my friends, it changed my thinking completely. I was a different person. In fact, it changed the entire course of my life. A similar thing happened to a young adult named Antonios. While at liturgy one day, he heard the hierarch read the assigned gospel that day, which coincidentally happened to be the one we heard today. When the young man heard the words of Christ, sell everything you own, distribute it to the poor, and come follow me, there was such a yearning zeal for his life in Christ that that's exactly what young Antonios did. Sold everything and followed Christ. And you may know this man today as St. Anthony the Great, the father of monasticism back in the third century. It is my belief that anyone who listens or reads the scriptures with a heart of attention and a heart of desire is going to change. You simply cannot remain the same if you read the scriptures. Your language will change. How you express yourself will change. You will no longer resolve to crude cursing. Your understanding of others will change. You'll think twice before you judge others. There will arise in you a struggle to see the pain of others. No matter what they're doing, you see their pain rather than their sin. Just a multitude of change. You know, it's funny. I was going to quote for you here at this point about the Holy Scriptures. I, I found a perfect verse in the Bible that Protestant preachers use, and they sound so powerful. And I was going to capture that verse and tell you how important Scriptures are. It's from Hebrews 4.12. I was so ready to say this. I wanted to sound like a fiery Protestant preacher. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say it. <laughs> For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of thoughts and the intents of the heart. A powerful argument for the strength of Scripture. But there's one problem that I didn't know until I did my research. When St. Paul was referring to the Word of God here, he was not referring to Scripture. He was referring, rather, to Christ himself, o logos tu theou the Word of God. Not the words of God, which is Holy Scripture. So, I couldn't use that. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, my friends, there is no shortage of the efficacy of the Bible according to the Fathers. The Scriptures are a medicine chest with remedies for every human ailment. It provides hope for all our griefs and troubles. It helps us to bear difficulties manfully. Does your wife provoke you? Does your son grieve you? Does an enemy plot against you? Does a friend envy you? Does a neighbor curse you? Does a lawsuit threaten you? Does poverty trouble you? Does misfortune depress you? Because conceit and 
desperation and compulsions and discouragement and grief surround us, my friends, on all sides. And a multitude of missiles fall from everywhere, it seems. But Chrysostom says, we have a continuous need for the full armor of the Scriptures. It is a great means of security. And without it, we betray our salvation. Without the Scriptures, without knowledge of the Scriptures, if we are ignorant of the Scriptures, we betray our salvation. And we are left with the wisdom of the world. The things we hear on TV, we, we think, okay, that's the way to be. We are left with no discernment, no true guidance, no maturity, and no real hope. So, avail yourself, my friends. Avail yourself to the therapy and the comfort of the Holy Scriptures. And I guarantee you that your life will be decent and in order. God bless you today.